it's time to get your music radio ready with the Audio Skills Podcast. It doesn't matter what type of music you're creating or what gear you use. It's all about the technique. Get ready to turn your home studio into a place where your music goes platinum. Now give it up for your host, Scott Hawksworth. Hey, what's happening, everyone? Scott here, bringing you another episode of the Audio Skills Podcast. We have got just a dynamite show for you today, where we're going to be talking about recording and mixing great sounding vocals. Joining me to share his expertise on the subject is Rob Mazies, founder of Musician on a Mission. But before jumping into that, I first wanted to give a huge thank you to all of our listeners for the support. It's a new year here at Audio Skills, and I'm hoping to bring you all more audio advice and guidance as we roll along. By the way, if you like what we do here and you want to be a huge help, please, please do give the show a rating and a review on iTunes. You can do it on your phone or even from your computer. Let me know what you like about the show, how it's helping you. I love the feedback and getting more helps the show continue to grow. So thank you in advance. Okay, with all that said, it's time for your audio tip of the week. My tip this week is actually from Anthony Clint Jr. of Clint Productions, and it's about getting good results when using delay on a vocal. Delay can be a really powerful tool to make a vocal sit better in the mix or simply just sound better. Here's what Anthony had to say. One technique I like to use for delay on a lead vocal is to duplicate the lead vocal and add delay directly onto the duplicate track, turning the dry, wet setting all the way wet. Then I'll trim and keep the parts of the vocal that I want to have the delayed effect on that duplicate track. That allows me to control when and where the delay or echo effect on the lead vocal will come in. And I think that's just a really great tip to not only give you more control over the vocal, because that's one of the biggest things when you are producing or mixing a vocal, you want to have control over it. Time and time again, I talk to engineers and their big thing is the most control I can get over that vocal, that that'll get the best sound because I can do the things I want to do to make it sound great and be creative. So that's your audio tip of the week. So now I am very pleased to introduce Rob Mazes, audio pro and founder of MusicianOnAMission.com, which helps people improve the quality of their recordings and mixes. And he's going to be helping us explore mixing a bit, specifically on how to get great sounding vocals. Rob, welcome to the show, man. Thanks a lot, man. It's exciting to be here. I love doing podcasts, so thanks for having me on. Right on. And uh, are you excited for the upcoming holidays? Do you have any big plans? <laughs> yeah, well, um, so I'm going out to a place called Bled in Slovenia with some fam- family. It's uh, kind of Eastern Europe around that area. Um, oh, right on. At the moment already as we're talking and, and everyone else is coming out to visit. So nothing huge, just chilling out here. But how about you? Anything planned? Yeah, heading, uh, heading back uh, to see family in uh, Philadelphia. So um, uh yeah, I get on a flight next week and I'm just hoping, you know, I live in Chicago and I'm just really hoping that no snow, you know, diverts. Is it, <laughs> is it always sunny? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I wish. <laughs> uh, no, no. So, uh, so I'm just hoping to no travel issues because traveling in the holidays is always a bit of a nightmare. So it's good that you're mm-hmm. already at your place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fingers crossed everyone else can make it. Otherwise, I'm spending Christmas on my own, I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, to start us off, and especially for those who don't know you, can you tell us you know, a little bit more about your career and what projects you're currently working on, you know, Musician on a Mission? Yeah, sure. So I'll try and give you the short version. Um, started Musician on a Mission a couple of years ago, um, just as a way to kind of teach what I'd learned. Um, I was trying to you know, make it as a mixing engineer at the time. So it was also a way to bring in more clients. Mm-hmm. Um, that was about two years ago. Over the process of that, I've kind of now shifted my attention fully towards musicianonamission.com, started working on my own music more um, and less so for clients because what I found is that, and probably a lot of the people listening now are musicians who are recording at home, recording their own music. They probably you know, you know have a day job. They're just confined to like evenings and weekends. So that's yeah. kind of where I focus my time and energy in terms of teaching. And also that's where I've shifted my attention in terms of what I'm doing. So in terms of current projects, um, I actually just today hit publish on DistroKid for a new EP. 
And this is my first solo EP because I'm actually a bassist. So this is the first time I've like got behind the mic, but now some vocals, completely self-produced, just one mic. Everything's like in the box, easy drummer. Um, I actually recorded it in an Airbnb, just like with no treatment. <laughs> So that's that amazing moment just to kind of put myself in the zone that everyone else is in um so that hopefully will be up in a couple of days before christmas at least um besides that now looking to the future just shifting attention towards musician on a mission which um has gone extremely well so i love teaching now and that's that's my main focus and i guess that's what we're here to do today right on yeah and with that in mind Today, I want to talk about getting great sounding vocals in a home studio. This is something that I know a lot of people really struggle with. And my first question is, what do you think separates a great sounding vocal versus one that's not very good, amateur, not so great? (laughs) Yeah, so I, I get this a lot from working one on one with people. Um, and the, the natural tendency here is to like jump to the mixing phase. And we could talk about, well, a professional vocal, you need like good space around it. It needs like plenty of top end if we want it to have that kind of professional radio ready yeah. sound. But what I find the, the main issue is generally with home recording. Um, and if you're producing your own music, that kind of stuff. It goes way, way back to like the source material. It's the mm-hmm. the recording. It's the sound in the room. Um, you know, if you can just, if you don't have a treated room, just like play around with like mattresses, duvets to try and kill the reverb a bit in the room. Really spend yep. a lot of time at the source, um, but then also carry that on through to like the editing and, and comping process because when you get it right there, so you get the recording right um, and you, do lots of takes you can comp it you can pitch correct it that's where we start to get into this area of like professional we need we need like a professional vocal to start with if we ever want it to sound professional after mixing so it's hard to pinpoint one thing it's to me that's like the most important area it's like everything before you even start mixing before you even load up an eq or compressor um that's the stuff that's really important but within that it's you know it's various things probably recording quality before anything of course that's probably something that you've heard before get it right at the source um but yeah really can't emphasize that enough for sure yeah and you mentioned a few things you mentioned you know just whatever kind of treatment you could do or or if you're not in a place that can be you know easily treated right away using things like you know pillows or blankets or or, or you know whatever you have at hand mm-hmm. um rob did you have any other like tips for maybe i don't know mic positioning or something like that that maybe people could say okay here's like a good good thing that i can i can try right now to maybe capture a better vocal yeah absolutely i think the the biggest mistake i see people make is that um at at an early stage they don't understand the difference between a dynamic and a condenser microphone so you'll get um i'll come across people that have recorded with a dynamic mic uh, which is what i'm using now but they're like they're backing off it loads so it it's not mm-hmm. really using it to its how it's meant to be used you're meant to get right up close to a dynamic and vice versa with a condenser you want to be like at least five inches away um i think that's commonly just something i see time and time again people getting too close to the mic mm-hmm. if you've got a condenser get five inches away if not more and then at this point you do need to start to think about the room a bit more um and that's when we could start to talk about you know already mentioned it's like using mattresses to kind of kill some of the reverb but Mm -hmm. in terms of mic placement i think that's probably it you know back off the mic a bit more if it's a condenser if it's a dynamic then you're gonna have to get close um besides that just experiment there's no hard and fast rules um, obviously most people start with kind of mouth level five inches away just pointing at the face but you can experiment with like if you want it to be a bit warmer drop the mic a bit and angle it upwards um, mm-hmm. if you want it to be a bit brighter try moving the mic up and angle it downwards towards your mouth then play around with the angle just take some time because if you're in a home studio environment you've got the time to actually figure out what sounds best in your room with your gear with your vocals or with your uh, vocalist and your band whoever it is you've got the time available to you to to actually figure that out and once you figure it out once you can then just repeat that time and time again so really experimentation um but before that you need to know what kind of mic you're using and make sure you're not using it wrong i guess is the best way to explain it <laughs> yeah yeah no that's that's awesome advice and and i i really like that idea of you know experimenting i think so many people they they maybe mistakenly think that well there's just a perfect way i can I can do this if you just tell me. And it's like, well, your every room is different and you have different 
you know, sounds going on. So mm -hmm. maybe listening in a few different positions and trying a few different things with your mic uh, and, and with different setups uh, can can really help. And then, like you mentioned, once you find it, you know, just keep go keep going, you know, exactly. do what's working. Absolutely. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to mention in terms of singing to too close to being too close to the mic is uh if you're really struggling with that get yourself a uh, a pop filter because <laughs> that oh, will, yeah. that can stop you from <laughs> from getting too close to it if you're working with a condenser <laughs> that works really well if you're working with other vocalists as well who have a tendency to like move around a lot get too close it's like here's a physical barrier that you can't <laughs> you would have to you would have to crane your neck around to <laughs> get get past this <laughs> exactly yeah so that's yeah that's a great shout so, okay, gear recommendation time, real quick sidebar. Do you have any mics that you could recommend that you think are particularly great for getting a good vocal and, and realizing that, you know, if you're using good techniques, you know, a lot of mics can get you great results, but do you have any recommendations of specific ones? For sure. Yeah. So I love the, um, the SE Electronics SE2200A not the best name, but I feel like in this kind of more affordable range that most people will be looking at um the road nt1 is really popular there's a couple of mics around that range i think audio tech can make one as well 80 20 20 out of those like that bunch in that price range i much prefer the se 222 uh 2200a it's an awful name such a long name but <laughs> it sounds great um they have got a, a switchable version as well i believe um i've just got like the cardioid version which is what i'd recommend if you're working in a home studio anyway um it's a bit more expensive than like the Rode NT1, but it sounds warmer. It's got a nice bump around 10, 10 kilohertz, which for my voice, um, I'm like bass range. So that really mm -hmm. helps. But I find generally with a lot of voices, um, that gives them a nice bump and helps them to cut through the mix. But it's not too much. The NT1 I find sometimes is a bit harsh on a lot of vocalists. Um, it's hard to say because a really important thing with vocals is like finding the mic that suits the vocalist. So the more microphones you have, even if you have like three or four cheap mics, it's probably going to be better than having one expensive mic because then you can Agreed. try out, see what works. Again, we get back to this idea of like, if you're in a home studio recording yourself most of the time, just maybe buy a few mics, return the ones that don't sound great or see if you can rent some to find a good one before you buy. Um, but if you're working with other vocalists a lot, then it's probably worth having a few, but I would definitely check out that SE mic. Absolutely. That's really great advice too. I, I always encourage people, you know, Build out that microphone locker if you can. Mm. Save up, do that because uh, it's going to only help you. Yeah. So okay, we've we've covered that you have to get the vocals capture, get it right at the source, as the saying goes. Let's assume that 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 folks have done that and they are ready to start mixing. Let's get into some mixing tips here. And the first one that I wanted to talk about or type of thing is adding compression to vocals. And there are a lot of opinions out there about compressing them too much, not enough. You know, Rob, how do you approach compressing vocals? And do you have any like tips or advice for using compression in for vocals successfully? Yeah. So what I find really funny is like you say, there's a lot of conflicting advice out there. And obviously one reason for that is everyone goes about things in a different way there's no one right way to do anything especially in the era of recording mixing but sure I, f I think what a lot of people overlook is that it's so genre dependent and the reason there's so much conflicting advice out there is because everyone's talking about different genres <laughs> so you'll have one yeah. person that's like oh don't even use compression like we only want to use a tiny bit and it needs to be inaudible if they're working with jazz or um you know some kind of classical genre opera i don't know then then yeah absolutely but if you see a video where someone's saying oh you need like 10 db of game reduction it needs to be like super aggressive um, and it's because they're working with like hardcore music then yeah they're right too so it's so dependent on the genre um i think more than anything it's going to vary between vocalists as well but just take that into account um something that i've realized recently is how important references are um, mm -hmm. when I say references, I mean reference tracks. So when you're mixing, pull in a professionally released track from a similar, um, it, within the same genre from like a similar artist, compare your mix to that. And that'll kind of guide you to where you need to go. And once you can use references, um, and you're proficient at doing that and you develop your critical listening skills, you can pull a reference in for a genre, even if you've never worked in it before, listen to the vocals, focus on how much compression is there. And then you'll have your answer. 
Um, yeah. In terms of like actually applying that, because that, I suppose that's like bigger picture stuff of like how much compression do we actually want. Um, with vocals, it really comes down to automation. If you want like that pop sound or like a mainstream radio sound where the vocal is like uber consistent, which is what you're hearing when you hear like a, a pop sound, uh, yeah. you need to do that with automation. Compression is just like the finishing touch. It's like the icing on the cake. So what I try to do is use automation and make sure that comes before compression in the signal chain. And that might sound complicated, but what I mean by that is you could automate the vocal on the channel itself, just on the volume fader, as you would with any form of volume automation in your door, but then send it to another channel, create a new aux channel, change the output of the original vocal. So it's going to this new channel. So now we've got like a already consistent vocal going into this new channel and we can add compression there. So the signal going into the compressor is already consistent. And that's huge because now the compressor doesn't have to work as hard. It's easier for us to adjust the settings because we've already gone through and manually turned up the quiet words, turned down the loud words. So two different ways of looking at it there. First of all, you need to know like how much compression you're applying and that's going to be subjective. It's going to be genre dependent. But then when it comes to actually applying compression, make sure you're not just relying on compression alone for like a consistent volume you need to do that with automation if you're working with mainstream genres right on that is such an awesome answer and, and so many good tidbits there rob of, of of just how to approach that kind of thing and and yeah and, and i also think some people get too intimidated by compression mm. and it shouldn't be that intimidating um you know so don't be afraid to to put on the compressor and start playing around um but you know like you mentioned rob maybe do some automation first before you do that and and you'll get some pretty cool results yeah absolutely and i guess that's that's also genre dependent because it's with a, if i've got like a pop mix i'll sit down and spend an hour just automating the vocal but if it's like a, a jazz track you're not going to do that so <laughs> yeah <laughs> right. this is where it gets difficult so okay that's compressing vocals. Now EQ. EQing vocals is so helpful, but can also be a bit tricky. And, you know, obviously there are a few EQ moves that are good to take in general, such as, you know, rolling off, you know, low end unwanted noise. Do you have any EQ moves that you find you often make with vocals? And of course, realizing that every vocal is different, but if so, what kinds of frequencies do you target? Yeah, it's a good question. It's it is hard to give kind of a blanket um, to give blanket advice, like say, because everything varies so much. But the things mm-hmm. I find myself doing in terms of strategy, and I'll try and give some like frequency references here. Um, pretty much always boosting the top end, um, adding air above 10k. That's mm-hmm. And the the exact frequency will change. Sometimes it sounds good if you add a high shelf, boosting everything above. 14k sometimes that's all you need sometimes you have to go much lower down to like 8k but i pretty much always have to boost the top end in some way so Mm -hmm. that's that's consistent across most genres the other thing i find myself doing a lot in any kind of mix that's um dense if it's not a really sparse arrangement um and we've got like let's say it's a rock band setup you've got like guitars you've got a snare everything's kind of fighting the vocal for a space in the upper mid range and that's an area where i find myself focusing a lot when it comes to vocals finding an area in the upper in the upper mid range maybe it's 1k maybe it's 4k you have to kind of just sweep around there looking with a boost just until you find a sweet spot where it sounds nice something you can mm-hmm. emphasize um just to first of all bring out the vocal in the mix help bring it forward a bit but then also what you can do is try and you know reduce that frequency in any competing part so um on the guitar just like cut around that frequency range by one or two db um, on the snare, if it's competing with the vocal, once you found that air in the upper mid range that sounds nice, boost it on the vocal, cut everywhere else. And I, I don't mean cut like aggressively; I just mean like a nice, broad, um, kind of subtle one two dB cut on the guitars, for example. Um, sure. So just carving out that space, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and the the term that a lot of people use for that is uh, frequency slotting. But to me, that sounds like really aggressive. It's like we're slotting it into this frequency. So I prefer yeah. to use the term. <laughs> Uh, range allocation it's like once we find that sweet spot on the vocal and let's say it's 4k um we've allocated that frequency range to the vocal so now we want to avoid boosting 4k on the guitars for example and instead what we probably want to do is like dip that um and then lastly something i find a lot especially with home recordings 
Um, not so much if you're recording in a really well treated room, but if you're recording at home, I always find there's an issue with mud in the lower mid range. So mm-hmm. two to 500 Hertz, somewhere around there. Um, often there's, there's this muddiness that builds just from room resonances, especially in a rock band setup where again, we've got all these like instruments that are focused in the same area. Um, in that lower mid range area, we've got like guitars, we've got the bass, we've got the snare, um, keys, left hand of the piano, that kind of stuff. So that normally needs addressing. And again, pretty subtle, normally just cutting a couple of dB around like 300 Hertz, something like that. And you'll have to sweep around there to find it. Um, that's kind of maybe some guidelines there addressing like wider frequency ranges, not so much exactly 300 Hertz. I'm going to cut every time, but there's probably going to be somewhere in that lower mid range that does need addressing in the same way that there's probably going to be somewhere in that upper mid range that we can bring out. It's just that exact frequency is always going to change, but it will be within that range. If that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. And that is, that is really great advice. And, and yeah, it, it's good to point that out. Uh, you know, and I, I don't want to be a broken record here, but it is so important to recognize that every vocal is different. So, mm-hmm. you know, something that worked on whatever the vocal you were working on last week, it was like, oh man, I carved this out and it was so great. You know, if you have a different singer, that may not be exactly what you need to do uh on this time so yeah. so it's good to have those ranges instead of hey yeah always make a cut at 300 you know or something mm-hmm. like that exactly so okay sibilants and uh plosives 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 i always i always plosives. mix that up <laughs> <laughs> i call it plosives i don't know if that's right <laughs> i think i think it's plosives. maybe it's american <laughs> english but, no no you're, you're the you're the british guy you have <laughs> <laughs> it's it's your language originally so <laughs> um but for those who are unfamiliar, those are, you know, uh, for sibilance, those are the hard S sounds and then those other consonants like P, T, K for those who are unfamiliar. But they can be a pretty challenging for some producers to tackle. You know, how do you approach fixing those in a general sense? Is it just, you know, throw a de on there and be done with it? Or, you know, Rob, do you take other kinds of moves to tackle those types of things? Yeah, so I think DS is probably um, you know eighty percent of the time going to be needed. Uh, not not aggressively, but I find yeah probably eight out of ten mixes I am having to use some kind of DSing. Um, sometimes a quick fix is just to put it on like your vocal bus. If you've got all your vocals and backing vocals going to one channel, you can just throw it there. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't, but that's a, a quick fix. But mm-hmm. if you're having issues with sibilance um, and it's something that you're really struggling with and you know you're having to go really aggressive on a deesser uh, that's when you have to take a step back and look at other ways to fix that namely addressing it in the recording phase if if you have control over that try different mic positions if you don't if you don't sing right into the mic or if you ask the vocalist to sing like just to the right of the mic say like one inch to the right or one inch to the left so they're Mm -hmm. not singing exactly down the microphone often that helps mic choice is a big one so going back to what we were speaking about earlier with the nt1 can be quite harsh sometimes i also find that it's often quite sibilant so with a lot of vocalists certain mics will just bring out that sibilance too much and you have to use um, a slightly warmer microphone instead and then if you get to the point where you're in a you're mixing and it's too late you can't do anything about it in the recording phase but you've got this you know you're having a lot of issues with sibilance then the the best thing to do is just go through manually find those issues that the actual s's or the plosives where you're having an issue um, and just manually drop them down with some automation that's Mm -hmm. honestly the best way but obviously that's quite time consuming so if it's not a huge issue just ds uh you know at the end of the chain on the vocal quite often if not you can even try just putting it on the bus um that's you want to be careful with that but those are the quick fixes. Otherwise you do have to go back um, and address it at an earlier stage. Right on. And now uh, for the, the plosives, the, uh, the P, the T, the K, anything like that. Uh, is there anything else you think, uh, for that? Or is it just like, Hey, kind of go in and maybe EQ some things and try to deal with that. Go back to your mic positioning, same kind of thing. Uh, yeah, just pop shield. I, I find if, if you have a, a take that's got like plosives in it, and you weren't using a pop shield there's nothing you can do to fix that yeah <laughs> you can try it you can try manually dropping it uh it's probably going to sound weird though you, honestly with more so than with sibilance that's something that you really have to address at the source like use a pop shield there's no excuse not to um generally yeah. that's enough again if you're having issues and you're using a pop shield but you're still getting plosives 
it either means you're too close to the mic or again you can try just like singing to the right or to the left of the mic so you're not just like um, you haven't got like the plosive going directly into the microphone itself um but yeah pop shield <laughs> pretty much yeah and and by the way you know if you don't have the five or ten dollars for a pop shield you can actually make one just take a a, a wire hanger and bend it up and and get like a stocking or something and just put it on there there you go homemade pop shield so but if you're gonna spend a couple of hundred on a mic like you'd be crazy not to spend yeah, I mean, dollars on a pop if shield if you're getting it on amazon it's got the little ad to, to add to order <laughs> yeah. five dollars ten dollars something like that Do just it. get one yeah <laughs> so okay adding effects to a vocal uh it's something that can really improve how it sounds within the mix and you know add some flavor and color or if too much is added, it can uh, can be a problem, <laughs> like drained and reverb and not sounding so good. Mm-hmm. Rob, how do you approach adding effects to vocals? And do you have any advice for someone who, you know, is like, man, I really want to put some reverb on this, but they want to get good results and they don't want to just end up with those amateur sounding mixes where just the, the singer is drowning? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think... <sighs> a common mistake early on is to is to not use delays um i find personally in in a lot of genres i'm using delay just as much if not more than reverb to create a space around the vocal so that'll be a combination of maybe a stereo slapback delay where it's just a slapback meaning that it's not an echo where it goes on and on it's just like one repetition and on Mm -hmm. your delay plugin you just turn the feedback down to zero and you will have a slapback um a stereo one so it's different times on the left and right so it might be like 100 milliseconds on the left ear 150 on the right and that instantly gives the vocals a sense of space without drowning them in reverb like you say um, which is a big issue a lot of the time reverb will put a vocal further back in the mix and if we're working with mainstream genres where we want the vocal to be front and center um, and most genres nowadays would follow that suit then you don't want to be using too much reverb because it is going to put it further away so Using stereo delay like that, um, even timed mono delays, they just add a sense of space to the vocal. Often that's enough on its own, but I'm starting to hear that reverb's kind of coming back in the mainstream. And also in a lot of other genres, you do still need a bit of reverb, but you don't want to be relying purely on reverb. And then when it does come to reverb, you want to just like tuck it underneath. You don't want it to to be like majorly noticeable. Um, Try and keep the decay time short. So under two seconds, I generally find works best. Any longer than that, um, we're starting to like roll into the next phrase, which is what you definitely don't want. The longer the reverb tail is, the messier it's going to sound essentially. So shorter reverb tails help. Um, You can try experimenting with like a plate reverb on the vocal instead, just to like add some width without going over the top. I think besides all these kind of smaller tricks i suppose the overriding um, approach to this is to not rely on like heavy reverb for the vocals because Mm -hmm. you are gonna yeah you're gonna end up with a vocal that's way back in the mix that sounds odd out of place Um, instead you want to experiment with using delay combining that with a bit of reverb just to create a sense of space around the vocal without putting it further back having said that if you're doing it in a creative way and you you kind of you know what you're doing you're like ah this this chorus here will sound epic with a huge reverb um a really good example of that there was a recent track um i always forget the name i think it was selena gomez and hands to myself um and in the verse it's really close and intimate she sounds like she's right on top of the mic um and then in the the chorus or like the pre-chorus it just opens up and this like huge kind of reverb sound comes on the vocal. It's like this yeah. back wall just falls out and suddenly it sounds really epic. And then it's contrasted when it goes back into the verse, or I think it's even the chorus at this point, really nice and intimate. So obviously you can use reverb in a creative way, but if you just want to create a sense of space around the vocal uh, without putting it further back, then you do need to be a bit more proactive about it rather than just slapping on one reverb, combine some subtle reverb with some delays and that kind of stuff. Right on. And I think that's a, a good point out of that as well is, is, you know, all of this stuff we're, we're giving tips and advice for, you know, getting good sound and what can help you out. But if you have a creative reason for doing something, you know, for really compressing the heck out of that vocal or, you know, really adding a bunch of reverb, like Rob mentioned, then, you know, who are we to stop you from doing that? If, if, if you're going for a specific type of sound and, and you really want something that way, you know, mm-hmm. so keep that in mind as well is, is, you know, have the, 
don't, don't be afraid to be a little bit fearless and, and, uh, <laughs> wait, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> be fearless. Be don't fearless. Be afraid. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Okay, Rob. Uh, you know, we were talking about all these different kinds of effects, EQ, compression. So when you're producing vocals, uh, what kind of plugins, you know, do you really like? Might you recommend? Might you go so far as to even say you couldn't, you couldn't live without them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't think, to me, the, the, the exact plugins I'm using aren't the important thing. I mean, stock plugins just sound amazing now. Um, mm-hmm. I think the, what's more important is not feeling overwhelmed because there are so many options out there now. Um, you know, waves have always got sale on. You've got a ton of plugins um, in your door. There's like so many different manufacturers out there. There's mm-hmm. everyone's got their own preferred plugin. It's just overwhelming. So I think instead, the important thing is to you know really learn stock plugins first of all. But then after that, if you are going to delve into the realm of premium plugins, um, and if you still think your mixes um, don't sound, if you if you're not happy with your mixes and you think it's because of stock plugins, you're not ready to upgrade yet because you can get yeah. great mixes with stock plugins. Once you get to the point where your mixes sound great using stock plugins, but you want th- to take that next step, uh, then when you venture into that world of premium plugins, I just recommend you have kind of like one workhorse or one kind of go-to plugin that you're going to use 80% of the time um, for each type. So I'll have like one EQ for me. That's the Fab Filter Pro Q2. That's like yeah. my go-to. EQ, I'm using that like 80% of the time. Um, compression, I've just started again using Fab Filters compressor, but it, I don't think it really matters exactly what I'm using. Um, Waves makes some, I, I'm a big fan of Waves plugins, especially because they're so affordable now. I think they've done a great thing um, bringing like top end hardware into the digital realm and making it really affordable. So mm-hmm. they, they have a range called the Renaissance range. Um, I think it's called R Comp or Renaissance Compressor. That's another great kind of workhorse compressor. So besides, yeah, in terms of vocals, I don't really have any specific plugins that I'm using just for vocals. It's more that I kind of use my go-to plugins. So that's Pro Q2. Um, yeah, Fab Filter Compressor. I really like the uh, Manny American Delay for stereo delays. Um, that's another Waves plugin. Reverb, I really like um, Eventide Stereo Room on vocals. I, I use Valhalla Room. That's like my go-to reverb most of the time. But on vocals, I actually really like using um, Stereo Room just to tuck like a, a nice kind of chamber reverb um, underneath the vocal. Besides that, I really like using um, L- the LA-2A. I use a, a Waves emulation of that. I think it's like CLA-2A because just any emulation of that piece of hardware is going to sound great on vocals and it's so easy to use because mm-hmm. there's just one just turn up the gain um until you're seeing the amount of compression you want and that sounds great but honestly you know obviously if you're at that point where you are buying premium plugins then go and check some of that stuff that stuff out but if you're not at that point yet don't worry you can get a great sound with stock plugins um it's only if you want to take it to the next level you can start to look into these options That's a great answer to that and so many great recommendations and advice. And I want to reiterate what you said. You know, if you are struggling with your mixes and you think it's because of your stock plugins, then you are not ready to upgrade and get premium plugins because Mm. you can get great results with stock plugins. Rob, that is awesome, awesome (laughs) advice. I I seriously want to like put that on a plaque <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a great it's a great like question it's almost like a thought experiment it's like hmm, yeah. am i blaming my mixes on my plugins yes i'm not ready so yeah. that's a good definitely a good question to ask yourself yep yep okay so and you mentioned this a bit earlier in the show you were talking about you know your vocal comps and you know editing and, and putting together you know that that quote unquote, perfect vocal performance. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips or advice for getting better results with that, being more efficient? You know, do you have a kind of workflow that you approach? Because I think some people get really bogged down with the vocal editing and maybe they have too many takes and all these kinds of things. And then, then they just get buried. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you need to make sure you understand like the the kind of comp functionality in your door a lot of most doors now will have like some way of handling um overdubs comps whatever you want to call them in logic which is my the door that i'm using now um i moved from pro tools about a year ago um love logic yeah yeah dude logic's (laughs) awesome um 
it's, it's all built in so you just record over the top and you've got this like really easy way to like choose between the takes even if you're and this is what i tend to do especially if it's like a mainstream track is like have pretty much a different take for every word it, it, you can go that in deep with it normally it's not that case it's like you know phrases you choose for each um phrase you choose the best take so in terms of yeah advice there it's like make sure you understand how to manage that in your door because the next piece of advice i have is take um do more takes than you think necessary because the more you have to work with the more the better the end result is going to be so if you're doing like 30 different takes uh, you need to make sure you understand how to like manage them properly in your door so definitely look into that and then yeah this is another common problem i see People, you know, they wonder why their tracks don't sound professional. I'll take a look um, at their project files and it will just be like one or two takes of the vocal. And that's just, it's just not possible to get a professional sound with that little to work with. You'd mm -hmm. be amazed, I bet, if you could see like a, a, a Nicki Minaj track, like how many <laughs> takes there were, <laughs> how much like work has gone into like every single word. Um, maybe Nicki Minaj isn't a great example, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, Any yeah. Pop track, and it's it would have been comped to hell and then edited, pitch corrected, everything. So record lots of takes, more than you think necessary, at least three, even if it's like the best vocalist ever and they nail it straight away you still want, you know, three to five takes just so you've got more to work with, um, but probably more in most cases and make sure you actually know how to manage them in your door. I think that's good advice for sure. Um, okay. Only a few more questions here. When mixing vocals, what do you think the biggest mistake people make is and how could they avoid that mistake? I suppose we've probably kind of touched on a lot of the 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 basics. I think that's probably yeah. a common issue is like trying to go too quickly, um, thinking about effects before you've even got like a good recording. Um, yeah. If we're focusing specifically on the mixing phase, then I definitely think it's like lack of automation. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, again, that is genre dependent. We already kind of touched on that. But if you're working in in a genre that you want to sound kind of like a radio sound and mainstream sound, then you are going to need lots and lots of automation. Um, besides that, I think reverb as well. You do hear a lot of people who very heavily rely on reverb, drench the vocal in reverb. Um, often that comes from a place. If it's your own vocals, it comes from a place of um, you know lack of confidence. You, yeah, you don't like the sound of your own vocal, so naturally yeah. you want to kind of in reverb uh, but yeah you don't want to cover up your mistakes that way you want to take a step back make sure and this it's not technically a mixing mistake but you want to make sure like you've got the best thing to work with when you do start mixing because you're you can't you know you can't just put a band-aid on it you can't fix it um if if you haven't got good source material so i think in terms of mixing mistakes it's hard to say but just overall common mistake is not spending enough time on those earlier stages so that when you do get to mixing it's easy and you've got like a really nice vocal to work with um, and to take to the next level and kind of like nudge to perfection for sure for sure okay last question just general mixing you know we've been focusing in on vocals here but let's take a step back rob when it comes to mixing what's if you could give one parting piece of advice on mixing and, and for, for getting good results, one tip, what might you, what might you say? If I could pick just one, I think yeah. it would be use reference tracks and get good at using reference tracks. The more people I work with on a one-to-one -one basis, the more I realize how important this is because everything else flows on from that if you can critically analyze a piece of music and this isn't just for mixing or recording this is like everything this is songwriting mm -hmm. um this is all of it if you can critically analyze a piece of music and focus on the melody the harmony the rhythm um if you can focus on the production how loud is the vocal what effects have been used what's the balance like how much low end is there what's the relationship between the kick and bass how much top end is there on the vocal in general on the cymbals once you have the ability to critically analyze a piece of music in that way you can then identify your own flaws so i could mm -hmm. tell you that like the, the best advice i could give you is um you know if it wasn't going to be this it'd probably be something along the lines of like focus on the essentials use stock plugins really learn how to do all of that before you even venture into like multi-band compression all this crap yeah. you just need eq compression <laughs> like the basic tools that's all you need but 
you're never going to understand how to use those tools if you don't have the listening skills to actually kind of analyze what you're doing um, and to critically analyze other pieces of music because that's going to guide you through that whole process of learning how to use EQ, how to use compression. So in terms of actually taking action on this, what I recommend is um, if you're not already doing it, start using reference tracks pull in three or four tracks um to your next mix and just you know every few minutes just flick through them every time you have a question you're not sure about something how loud should the snare be you flick through your references try and keep mm -hmm. them in a, a um how loud should the vocal be etc you flick through your references and just start to listen to music a lot of the time on the headphones that you're mixing in or your um, monitors just get used to critically analyzing music and the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. And then all the pieces will start to fall into place because you'll start to understand why different genres sound different, why mixes approach tracks in a certain way. You can then start to understand, you know, what should the space around the vocal be? We spoke about it here, but that's actually a very difficult thing um, to hear yeah. when you're listening to a track. It's hard to, you know, focus purely on the space around the vocal. <laughs> Unless you have the listening skills to do that, you're never going to be able to replicate that yourself. Um, and you know, learning any craft, you start from replication. Eventually, once you get towards mastering the craft, you start to be more creative. But you start by replicating others, and you, you can't do that unless you have those listening skills. So reference tracks, um, just critical listening in general, anything you can do to practice that, and then just use lots of reference tracks when you're mixing. I think that's going to be kind of the best advice I could give anyone because everything else will kind of follow him from there. Rob, that is awesome, awesome advice. And I wanted to thank you so, so much for joining us today and really walking us through getting a great sounding vocal. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's it's been great. You're a, you're a great host, by the way. <laughs> well, thank you. I do my best. <laughs> a, you've got this down to an art. I think this is, yeah, this has been really fun. So uh, absolutely honest to be here. And thanks again for for inviting me on. Right on. And uh, for the folks listening, uh, be sure to check out Musician on a Mission. And actually, if you're interested in, you know, learning more about getting great sound, great vocal sound, um, you can check out musicianonamission.com forward slash audio skills. And, and Rob, you have a, is it, is it a, a series of videos? That they yes, can it's, it's, um, it's a, a multi-part series on recording mixing vocals in a home studio we're going to go through the the whole process the first video um is called i think it's the six steps to um, a mix ready vocal so we're going to be talking about all that stuff that we um, spoke about here but in more detail and then the other two videos focus on mixing eq compression um so that you can really start to understand the start to finish process of making a professional radio ready kind of sounding vocal at home in a home studio with budget gear with stock plugins whatever you're using um and it's completely free so you just have to go to that page uh, musicianonmission.com forward slash audio skills enter your email and uh, you'll get instant access to the first video and the, the next ones are kind of dripped out over the over the next week or so boom and there it is and thank you all so much for listening today and as a reminder for links and information about today's show and our guest please check out our show notes at audioskills.com forward slash podcast now wherever you are whatever you're working on whatever kind of music you want to make just go out there and make it great thanks ready to go even deeper with your recording mixing and music production we've got all the info and techniques you need in one place so you can turn it up go to audioskills.com and access a huge library of video tutorials and private workshops so you make progress even faster come back next week for a brand new episode of the audio skills podcast we